Joining us this evening is Christy Davis. Christy is the curator of exhibitions at the Canton Museum of Art. She joined the museum in 2019. Prior to joining the Canton Museum, Christy was the registrar at the Pro Football Hall of Fame for 12 years. She holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Studio Art with a specialization in two-dimensional design, along with bachelors in both psychology, art therapy, and a minor in art history from Capital University. <laughs> and she also holds a Master's in Arts Administration from the University of Akron. So we are so excited to have you with us tonight, Christy. Thank you for your time and for joining us. And thank you to all of our supporters of our art program and all of you that have continued to join us for our virtual programming here at the library. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can use the Q&A box down at the bottom and we'll, um, you can go ahead and put your questions in at any time and then we will probably look at them after the presentation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Christy, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to share with you um, this exhibit. It's a great exhibit. And like you said, um, it's on display through March 7th. We do have time ticketing um, available through our website. So you can plan ahead for your visit. Um, and we have three other exhibits going on at the same time. We have uh, In the Garden, Nature's Beauty from the CMA's Permanent Collection. We have ceramics from the Anthropocene, ceramics by uh, Dennis Miners. He's a potter who um, focuses on the animals and ecosystem, endangered animals and human impact. Um, they're amazing ceramics. And we also have 60 Proof, Six Decades of the Whiskey Painters of America, um, which are miniature watercolor paintings. And I use the term watercolor loosely because rather than using water, they use liquor of their choosing, mostly whiskey. Um, as part of the medium for their painting process. Um, the Camp Museum of Arts collection consists of over 1500 pieces of art with a focus on American works on paper from the 19th century forward, an emphasis on watercolors, as well as American ceramics from the 1950s through today. Obviously a exhibit highlighting American Impressionism um, is a natural fit for our museum given those parameters. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and hope that I can get this to work. Let's see, there we go. I also wanna apologize in advance as I get started. If you hear dogs barking or children, um, you know, this whole being at home through all of this definitely has its <laughs> elements of fun to say the least. Um, so getting started, from the 1870s to the 1930s, the United, or the United States of America was bracketed by the Civil War and the Great Depression. Um, America experienced profound social and cultural changes and in the visual arts that gave rise to Impressionism. After quickly recovering from a war that seemingly could have threatened its very existence, the United States entered a period of growth in population, industry, and national wealth. If you think about this time frame of the 1870s to 1930, you can really picture all of the changes that were happening in industry. It was a huge time of growth in American history and filled with a renewed sense of optimism and self-confidence, Americans began reaching out to the world in ways previously unimagined. Um, travel became much more widely accessible for um, more people and in a number of different ways. Um, rising wealth in a society that prized commerce, progress, and education sparked growing interest in the arts. And in that, the founding of new art clubs, art schools, and art museums. Cities and towns actually competed to distinguish themselves by providing their swelling populations with stimulating cultural experiences. Um, the widespread belief that educated citizens are essential to economic development spurred the founding of public art galleries and museums at like a pace that had not been seen before. Ohio was a leader in this cultural phenomenon and the evidence of that is still obvious today. You look at our state and we have so many amazing cultural institutions and museums um, and uh, there were numerous art museums and institutions 
that were founded between 1878 to 1922 as a result. Impressionism in its broadest sense was it emerged in France in the late 1860s when a small group of artists began exploring a new method of painting. They were inspired by the poet Charles Baudelaire, who was quoted as saying, "Painter, they should be artists should be painters of modern life. And they worked quickly, often outdoors, and what's termed as plein air style. Um, they applied paint with rapid broken brush strokes that called attention to the actual painting process. When you see an impressionist painting in contrast to traditional, what was, what's recognized as traditional painting styles, traditional painting has a very smooth, clean polished look to it. Um, you can't easily see the method and the way that the artist created the piece. In impressionism, um, in many ways, you can see the movement in the work. You can see where the artist took their brush and made a stroke that went upward into um, a drape of fabric or whatever the subject matter may be. Um, they favored pure color squeezed directly from the tube rather than using grays or natural or neutral tones. And this created a color intensity that hadn't widely been seen before. And it's in the title of our exhibit. And I know I'm going to abuse saying the word um, tonight, but really it was bringing light to the, the campus, to the paper. Um, and you'll see that in some of the pieces that I share with you tonight. The first piece I have to share is by a Cincinnati born artist, Elizabeth Norse. And the painting is titled La Mer. And I apologize, I never took French. Um, I took four years of Spanish in high school, never French. So I'm sure I will butcher some of these phrases and words, but she and her twin sister both enrolled at the McMicken School of Design in 1874 in Cincinnati. Her sister was a woodcarver and Elizabeth obviously became a painter. She studied briefly in New York before traveling to Paris in 1887, where she enrolled at the Academy Julian School for Women. It was there that this painting was shown at the salon and hung on the line, which if you're familiar with the salon style, um, we actually had an exhibit a few years ago of every piece in our collection hung salon style in our galleries. And it's everything wall to wall, all across the wall. So this piece was hung on the line, which meant it was at the most advantageous eye level position, the best view that you could have. Um, and as a woman, that's notable because really this was a man's world. And her work is noted as having a spiritual depth that is lacking in most French Impressionism and the subsequent American developments in Giverny. Um, this piece specifically, and I apologize for the photograph, I took this with my phone to include in this because I have high res images, but they don't include the frame. And I feel like the frame really kind of helps project um, some of what I wanted to speak to tonight. Um, this piece shows many aspects and color palette of the more traditional style of painting but it also incorporates the more pure color tones and the loosening of the brush strokes evident in Impressionism. Um, and I'll repeatedly say this tonight, but a lot of these pieces really need to be seen um, in person to get the full effect of what they have going on in them. This next piece by another Cincinnati artist, John Henry Twatman, Dark, Tweet, Dark Trees <laughs> Cincinnati, um, Again, is that early impressionist look. You can still see the um, palette tones of traditional painting, but also the looser brush strokes in that lower grassy area in the foreground. Um, he too studied at the McMicken School of Design before traveling to Munich to enroll in the Royal Academy of Fine Art. It was a trip to Paris, however, that where he studied at the Academy Julian where he met Theodore Robinson and Child Haslam, who we'll talk about later, um, that he began to lighten his palette in the more traditional um, Impressionist style. As with this piece, again, you can see the darker palette, you can see the looser brushwork um, starting to evolve. And this piece that my uh, PowerPoint wanted to jump to early on should look familiar. This piece has been used in all of our marketing 
um, for this exhibit and actually for this event as well. This piece is in a private collection, so it's not widely seen or viewed by anyone other than the family that owns it. And the title is Drifting on the Lagoon, Venice, or Drifting with the Tide. And this is quintessential Impressionism style. Um, Ralph Wormley Curtis spent most of his life working in Europe, and he had a close relationship with fellow American Impressionist John Singer Sargent. Um, his family had a palazzo in Venice where they formed a core circle of American expatriates. And I, I like to think of his palazzo and this group of American expatriates and artists as being kind of an early version of um, Warhol's factory, where you just had all of these creatives together, poets and writers and painters and um, everyone just kind of thriving off each other's creativity and um, really being uh, inspired by each other. So in this painting, you can see the woman with her face and body clearly defined and lit with the early evening, that golden hour lighting. Um, and there's really a focus on her face and those aspects of this painting. The rest of it embody that loose brushwork um, known for uh, Impressionism. So as I said before, travel was something that was much more accessible during these times. Um, and there were American artists in the 1880s who were working home and abroad, and they formed art colonies that promoted outdoor painting at places as distant as Giverny in France, um, which is actually where Claude Monet lived as well as um, places, you know, stateside like Coscob, Connecticut. As represented in this exhibit, these American artists traveled extensively throughout the United States and Europe, but it wasn't limited to only those places. There were artists who also traveled to Japan and um, the Middle East and Northern Africa and Central America and really all over the place. And they, captured essentially images of the world during this time frame with their brush. Um, one of the more well-known American Impressionists that you may have all heard of before is John Singer Sargent. And he was American, but it's kind of American with an asterisk, I feel, because he was born in Florence to American parents um, and spent his early years traveling through Europe and enjoying a cosmopolitan lifestyle living mostly in Paris and London. He began drawing as a child and had studied privately in Paris. On a trip to Giverny in 1885, he painted outdoors with Claude Monet. I can't even begin to imagine what that experience would have been like. And in 1887, he made the first of many trips to the United States where he served as a role model for a generation of American Impressionists. Um, he was known originally for his portraits. However, he found that he was very passionate about his landscapes, such as this one that's from our permanent collection, um, titled On the Terrace. And he closed his studio and stopped painting portraits altogether in 1907. Um, one of the interesting aspects of his landscapes, um, in my opinion, is that it doesn't seem like he chooses the, the typical um, subject matter for his landscapes. You wouldn't necessarily step outside of your door, look at the steps and say, I need to paint those. Um, however, he made them interesting by the way that he played the light off of the shadows. And the focus in this piece seems to be more on how it's lit rather in this natural light, rather than what's actually in the, in the piece itself. So um, one of the most exciting parts of curating an exhibit like this is that there are so many pieces from private collections that you know, may have never been exhibited. And if they have been, it may have been decades. Um, and as labor intensive as the process is, as we have a small staff and there's, um, you know, when you come, when the paintings get to you, you have to uncrate them you have to take them out, look them over. Um, 
and uncrating was one of the more exciting parts of this entire process. This was one of the pieces that when we uncreated it, we all kind of stopped and had that wow moment. The vibrant color of this piece and the detail within it, um, the image doesn't do it justice. And I highly encourage um, that if you are able to come see the exhibit in person that you do so. Uh, this is another piece that, or this is a piece that anytime I'm in the galleries, I find myself drawn to it for one reason or another. I find an excuse to go and kind of get lost in those palazzos across the way. And Robert Bloom is widely recognized as a quintessential American Impressionist. He was from Cincinnati, later settled in New York City, where he worked as a magazine illustrator. Um, made one of his first trips to Venice in 1880, where, and then visited France and Belgium after that, and later Japan. Like many of his American colleagues, he developed a style that merged aspects of Impressionism with firm drawing and structure. So in this piece, for example, you can kind of tell in the image, but the buildings are painstakingly detailed. And it's incredible to me that given the scale, because this isn't a huge piece, it's 16 by 24, um, those fine lines and those fine details that he has in that background are incredible. And then the reflection of those buildings on the water and the rippling effect in the water, um, it's amazing to see in person. William Merritt Chase is an artist that um, really, if you were to play Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon um, with an artist, especially with Impressionism, William Merritt Chase is one of those that I think most of, if not all of the artists in this exhibit can be traced back to William Merritt Chase in one way or another. Um, he was often cited as the first American artist to paint fully Impressionist works in the United States. And he was born in Indiana, studied in New York and Munich, and then traveled to Venice where he painted with John Fotman. He returned to the United States and taught at art schools in New York City and Philadelphia. And again, many of these artists in this exhibit were students of his. Um, he later established his own school at Shinnecock, Long Island in 1891. And he took students on trips to Europe to paint and mentored a generation of American Impressionists. He started painting urban parks in New York City in the mid 1880s and views of the beach around his summer school in the early 1890s. Um, later in his work, this piece is from around 1895, he began to incorporate his wife and children into some of his landscapes where previously he had left figures out of those altogether. So while it's not confirmed, um, it's presumed that the woman and the two children that we see in this piece are in fact his wife and two of his children. Um, this piece is on loan to us from the Toledo Museum of Art and um, it, it's large <laughs> and it's heavy. Um, I was thankful that we had preparators to help us um, with the install of some of these larger pieces for sure. Um, so this piece has an interesting backstory in a number of different ways. Um, the acquisition of this piece by the museum actually is what sparked this entire exhibit. Um, when this was purchased for the collection, uh, a conversation began between our executive director, Max Barton, and our my predecessor and former chief curator, um, Linda Aerosmith, in regards to hosting or creating an original American Impressionism exhibit. Um, Child Haslam is recognized as developing one of the finest, purest forms of American Impressionism. He was born in Boston and started out as a wood engraver and an illustrator, made his first trip to Europe in 1883. And two years later, he was painting city views of Boston reflective of that French Impressionist style. He returned to Europe in 1886, where he painted this piece, Bleak House Broadstairs, while visiting a seaport village in Kent County, England. Um, this piece has an added story to it that our permanent collection curator, curator of permanent collections, she's on here, so I wanna make sure I get her title right, um, shared with me that that building at the top of this piece, the Brown building is actually, or was actually the summer home for Charles Dickens. And it's also 
the place where he wrote David Copperfield. Um, the woman in the foreground, you'll notice, is reading a book, which is a is a fun little nod to the author from the artist. This is another Child Hassam piece. It's stark difference. The other one was much lighter. This one is obviously at night, midnight. Um, and it's a great depiction of a cityscape during a snowstorm. As being from Northeast Ohio, I'm sure we can all um, <laughs> think of our own experiences in this type of a setting and almost feel like you're there. Um, the cars have evolved a little bit from then to now, but you can sense being out in that cold in the snowstorm in the dark. And to me, the part that really stands out is that halo of light that you can kind of pick up in the photograph, but it really stands out in person. The halo of light that circles those street lamps that you kind of get that haze from the snowfall happening. Um, so with this one, we kind of jump ahead to post-impressionism style a little bit more. And I'm only going to touch on that because that's not really the focus of our exhibit, but um, the artist Theodore Butler, he was a Columbus-based artist. So you see a recurring trend. A lot of these artists were from Ohio and our um, border states. Um, he echoed, you look at this painting and you can see a lot of the stylistic tendencies of Claude Monet. You see the color palette similar to what Monet would use. And um, even if you were a novice to um, American art, or to art history in general, you might pick up that it's impressionist. He was born in Columbus, studied at art in Ohio and New York before he moved to Paris in 1885. He settled in Giverny and painted alongside Claude Monet. Interestingly, he was never a true student of Claude Monet. He just was friends with him, which um, is interesting because he then marries Claude Monet's stepdaughter, Suzanne. Um, and then actually later when she passed away, um, he married her sister. So he was very close with the Monet family to say the least. Um, upon his death in 1936, he was actually buried in the Giverny Village Cemetery adjacent to the Monet family as well. Um, and this piece, as you can see, is on loan to us from the Columbus Museum of Art. This is another piece that um, when I was talking about bringing pieces out of the crates, this is one that really um, stood out to me. And it's another one that captures my glance anytime I'm in the galleries. But um, Philip Leslie Hale is the artist and um, trying to get things to cooperate here. Um, he was born in Boston, but after years of study in New York and Paris, he spent numerous summers painting at Giverny. Uh, this painting titled Hollyhocks is an example of his later work where he moved from the more delicate style of impressionism toward a bolder manner of condensed powerful forms with large areas of intense color. So you can see there's lots of white and you have the greens and a little bit of that shadow play in the Hollyhocks, but the predominant color of this is very pale and white. And what stood out to me was the woman's hair. Um, black was not a tone that was used in Impressionism very frequently. And that was due in part to the fact that they believe that black didn't occur in the natural world in its purest form. So they found other ways to get those dark tones. Um, her hair, it's implied, is black or dark brown. However, that color or those colors are not used at all. It's all consisting of blues and reds and pinks and purples. And I believe there's a little bit of like a turquoise green color in there as well. So it's really striking to see all those colors that kind of came together to make that dark hair look natural because I, would find it hard pressed to believe that in 1922 women had purple hair. Um, if this was painted yesterday, then it, we would just think, oh no, she has blue hair. Um, 
And then the contrast with the flowers pinned to the side of her head as well. It's a great um, composition and layout all together. So another aspect of our exhibit is highlighting the women of the American Impressionist movement. So when you look at, again, that time frame that Impressionism was happening between the Civil War and the Great Depression, so much was happening in American history. And um, one of which was women's rights and the 18th Amendment and the women's right to vote. And there was this movement for the new woman. And as part of that, women were taking jobs that they hadn't previously had the opportunity to take. Um, they were doing things that had never been made available for them. Included in that was their ability to attend art academies. And the rules that barred them from attending those schools were revoked during this time frame, and they became a powerful force in the visual arts. Um, we have quite a few women in this exhibit. Jane Peterson, Alice Shelley, Helen McCarthy, Martha Walter, and uh, Elizabeth Norris and Lillian Westcott Hale. Lillian Westcott Hale was actually the wife of Philip Leslie Hale, and she is often, <laughs> it's debated as being the stronger artist of the two. Um, but Jane Peterson is actually the most heavily represented artist in this exhibit. Um, she has five pieces in this exhibit, um, Child Hassam, John Singer Sargent, and Edward Pothass, which I realize I didn't include any of his pieces somehow in this presentation. They each have four pieces in the exhibit. So I think that speaks to not only her talent, but her presence in um, the art world at this time. Um, so looking at some of Jane Peterson's work, uh, Holiday Evening, Palm Beach. This piece is really uh, powerful in that those lanterns that are hanging amidst the trees, firstly, she used a very bright, vibrant color. Um, that's a stark contrast to the shadows cast by those palm trees. But um, I love how it's dusk and although it's getting dark outside, all the people sitting underneath the lanterns are illuminated um, again with the light references, but um, it's really a striking image. And Jane Peterson um, was a force to be reckoned with. She, you know, many of the artists in America at this time that were doing this travel, many of them were from affluent families or had means to travel um, and had money in some way or another or exposure to the ability to travel. Uh, Jane Peterson did not. She was born in Elgin, Indiana, and she was the second of four children to born to parents who were first generation American. And money was tight and she had a gift at a young age for fine art and it was nurtured by actually the public school systems and she also she took an art test um where her skills were tested and that was how her parents kind of determined whether this was real talent anything to be noted or if it was just you know somebody with a hobby and she excelled at that test and she ended up borrowing $300 from her mother to cover for moving expenses to go to art school in New York. Um, once she was there, she supplemented her funds and covered her expenditures by offering private art lessons. And she also spent some time as a public school art teacher. Also, she was able to travel eventually due to, um, both taking courses that travel was part of the package and also by finding a wealthy benefactor who funded her trips abroad um, so she could continue to paint and expand her skill. And her skill of capturing life in diverse places with attention to topographical detail is seen throughout her work in the exhibit. Um, another piece by Jane Peterson is this one sunlight and shadow constantinople and this one i like to picture so it's a relatively smaller piece um square piece which is common for plein air painting 
So I picture this, you can almost hear the busy um, marketplace and you can kind of feel like she was standing there with her easel painting the scene right there on the corner of that street. And many of these artists, even going back to drifting on the tide, somebody was there to capture that moment with that woman in the gondola. I mean, there weren't smartphones with cameras where you could capture that and then paint it later. They may have had somebody sitting there who sketched the piece, but um, if it wasn't sketched right then, the whole thing was painted then. And I think that that really says something. And given her use of the broad, large patches of color with this bold color to it, um, that looks very plein air-esque in the sense that you have to paint quick because your light is shifting at all times. And um, we have a few pieces similar to this one in the exhibit. And it's just powerful to think that you can actually feel like you're standing in that moment with the artist um, when they were painting the piece. So another um, Ohio artist, Alice Schilly, um, being that I went to school in Columbus and Alice Schilly is from Columbus, I became very well aware of her art um, and her presence in the city. She spent her life painting, traveling and teaching and studied in Columbus and at Shinnecock with William Merritt Chase. She traveled for over 30 years and painted her experience. Um, we had an exhibit of her miniature watercolors this past fall. And what really impressed me about the miniatures was not only the expanse of travel that was depicted in these pieces, but also many of them were maybe six inches by four inches. They were pretty small. And the amount of detail that she packed into these watercolors, which is not an easy medium to um, master, but she was able to capture so much detail in such a small space, but then she can also pull off just as a powerful of a piece in these large scale pieces like um, Mother and Child in the Garden, France. Um, you can also kind of see in this image, I know it's hard with a PowerPoint, but in the lower left-hand corner, she signed her paintings simply A. Shilly. She didn't write Alice Shilly. And that was due in part to the fact that this was a male dominated industry and she didn't want her gender to determine her worth for an exhibit. So if her piece was going to be submitted for an exhibit or a viewing, she wanted it to be judged for the piece itself, not predetermined based off her gender. So um, you'll find that also in this piece, a windy day and actually it's a little bit easier to see it down the right hand corner um, this piece is oil on canvas, and it's another example of the early influence of Impressionism with brilliant colors and quick broken brushwork. And again, you can feel the sense of that windy day from the little girl in the middle holding her hat on tight because the wind is blowing, um, the flowers, the angle of the flowers blowing in the breeze, um, the mother holding the youngest child, tight to her to kind of shield from that piercing wind. Um, so we, there's just some really strong images in this exhibit and I understand I'm biased. <laughs> um, another Shilly, this one from our permanent collection titled White Houses, has an incredible color intensity that's achieved by surrounding the forms in this strong blue line, which you don't often see. Um, there's also large areas of white to the painting. And then you have the shadows cast by the trees lining the street. And um, it's again, actually, if I would turn my video off right now, this is actually the image that I use as <laughs> my photo for um, Zoom calls. It's just an amazing example of um, both her skill and the Impressionist style in watercolor. Another um, female who took the stage in American Impressionism, Helen McCarthy, she was born in Poland, Ohio, and she really was a force in women's art. And she studied at the Philadelphia School of Design, and she was also a founding member of the Philadelphia 10. 
She was a member of several art groups and also I think co-founded or founded a number of art groups that focus on promoting women in the arts. Sunny Day Booth Bay Harbor, Maine is a classic American Impressionist depiction of a popular New England vacation port. And the woman holding a white umbrella provides a focal point to kind of zero in with all of the busyness of the trees and the grass. And it's just really a striking summer scene. Um, Another important fact to mention about Helen McCarthy is, as I said, she was a member of the Philadelphia Tent. She was also the first of the group to pass away. And the group was so moved by the loss of her spirit in their group that they vowed to continue to exhibit her work posthumously in each of their shows, which I think is a testament to both her as a person, her as an artist, and um, the tight-knit um, camaraderie and fraternity that was formed with many of these art groups. This is the last piece that I have to share um, with you tonight. And this one is interesting in that, as I said previously, Impressionists didn't widely use black because it doesn't occur in nature. Um, Martha Walter obviously used black. She was an American Impressionist known for her richly colored outdoor paintings. She studied again with William Merritt Chase before traveling through Europe extensively from 1908 to 1914. She painted plein air beach scenes at Gloucester and other sites along the Atlantic coast. Her work is spontaneous with a focus on color and hues rather than the subjects themselves. You can see there's very little attention and detail put into the faces and expressions of the figures in her work. Um, it's more on the shapes. And that was very true to the French Impressionist style. Um, going back to the use of black, um, where she used it in this piece still is true to the Impressionist in that it doesn't occur naturally in the world, but she used it on the bathing suits, <laughs> the swimwear of these women, which wouldn't have occurred naturally either. Um, but the other aspect of the avoidance of using black was that it was extraordinarily difficult to master and therefore omitted. You can kind of liken that to how many artists avoid um, using or drawing hands or depicting hands because of the difficulty in mastering um, hands well. So the fact that she not only was unafraid to use black, but did it well, um, speaks to her talents as well. So it was, we kind of talked about this in the beginning of the session, but um, for more information on our exhibit, we have a website dedicated to this exhibit, Dancing in the Light, um, which includes a virtual 360 tour. So if for some reason you aren't able to come to the museum, um, whether it be high risk or you just can't make it to Canton, um, please check out the 360 tour. It includes a narration from our um, museum to go and education outreach coordinator, as well as we also include um, videos made by William Robinson of the Cleveland Museum of Art, where he kind of goes over um, the history of American Impressionism, as well as Jim Kenney, who is our guest curator. And he's also, he owns Kenney Galleries in Columbus. And he was kind of one of the moving parts in procuring some of these pieces for the private collectors and for some of the um, museums that own them. So he kind of talked a little bit more about that history and um, process. You can reserve your tickets to visit the museum at cantonart.org slash reserve tickets. And I highly recommend doing so. Um, our time ticket slots have been selling out for this exhibit. We are free on Thursdays, thanks and by um, a partnership with the PNC Foundation. And we also have numerous programs, workshops, and classes related to our current exhibits. Um, so I was talking earlier about the Whiskey Painters of America, and we have a whiskey painting class where um, it's a whiskey tasting event and you're painting and you get to kind of 
um, join in, it's virtual, join with some of the Whiskey Painters of America. Um, additionally, we also have our full collection available for view at cantonartcollection.com. So you can learn more about what we have at the museum. Um, in talking about the 360 tours, we also have 360 tours of past exhibits. Um, and it's a great resource if you have kids studying at home or if you just are someone who likes to learn. Um, they're definitely something worth checking out. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I guess we're at any questions. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple questions here. Um, one, one of our patrons said that they saw the exhibit and loved it. They were wondering whether you focused on Ohio artists as there were so many of them. So a lot of the art specifically on Ohio artists. Well, um, I think a lot of that came from the fact that we worked with Jim Kenny. He was our guest curator and he was really the person who was, um, coordinating with the private lenders. There were a lot of his past clients and um, buyers. And so I think that's just what they gravitated towards and that's what was readily available. Um, there were many pieces that we wanted to get for the exhibit that for one reason or another just were not available. Um, and then thankfully nothing happened due to everything shutting down. Um, last spring, we were still able to stay on track with what we had hoped for, but it does also happen that Ohio is just really rich in talented artists. Um, we're a pretty great state. So, <laughs> um, it's fortunate for us. So, um, Pat asked, and this is, a, this is a really good question. How do you know, you guys as the museum, how did you know who had these pieces if they were from private collections? Well, we didn't. Um, that's where uh, Jim Kenny, and then we have a couple other um, gallery owners and people in the art world that we work with, and they're the ones that are also, you know, they're gallery owners, so they're selling and negotiating with buyers and collectors all the time, and they kind of have those records of who they sold to and what they sold them, um, and they have formed that rapport with them over time, so that really helps to have somebody that's in that part of that world um, to kind of help make those connections for you. So um, we had Betty said she loved the presentation and can't wait to see the exhibit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I can't wait for you to uh, see it either. <laughs> Edward asks, <laughs> any idea how Davis achieved the gossamer sleeve color within color? Wow. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what the the gossamer sleeve. Maybe Edward can. Um, I'm trying to think of what the. Maybe you can, let Edward, if you're still on, maybe you can give us a little more information. <laughs> <laughs> um, some uh, Iris asked, is there a catalog available for the exhibit? Yes, there is. And thank you for asking that question because I had intended to bring that up as well and <laughs> forgot. There is a catalog available. And actually, um, being that I'm sitting here in my room, I can pull it up. And this is kind of, well, the virtual background kind of <laughs> distorts it. But again, it has the drifting with the tide on the cover. And it is available um, through our Artisans Boutique at the museum. And you can actually, um, if you aren't able to come to the museum yourself, which um, is totally understandable given the circumstances, but um, you can call in and it can be shipped to you as well. So. Great. Um, Laura asks, did the work of the American Impressionists differ in any way from the Euro European Impressionists, either by subject or by technique or media? Um, it was very, very similar. Um, as you kind of get from the presentation, so many of these artists ran in the same circle. They either had the same instructors or visited the same places, went to the same schools. And um, really for, I would venture to say all of the American Impressionists, they at some point or another convened at Giverny where Monet was. So it was very, 
uh, organic and they all kind of just um, drew from each other. So there were very similar characteristics between the two. Uh, we have a couple patrons that asked kind of a similar question. For the paintings that are from private collections, are they compensated for you guys um, loan, you know, loaning them to the museum? Do they receive any kind of money? Well, um, I think really to collectors, if you're an art collector and you're investing that amount of money um, into something, it's most likely a passion of yours. And what we've found with so many of these private collectors is that they really want to share their art. They want to, they love this piece. Something made them want to purchase this piece and have it in their home. And so as a result, they want people to be able to see it. They don't want to necessarily invite a ton of people into their home, but they want to make it accessible so that um, more people can enjoy what it is. And also so that I think, you know, to some extent, it's kind of like, yeah, that's mine. Go see it at the museum. Um, <laughs> but there are collectors, and I've run into this a few different times, um, not necessarily at the Camp Museum of Art, but it, um, even at the Pro Football of Fame, I did an art exhibit there. And um, sometimes those pieces that are in private collections are really near and dear to the owner's heart. And it's hard for them to let them go because it's almost like letting your child out into the world without you. And um, in those instances, we have been able to kind of work with the collector and maybe um, a high res reproduction is made to kind of be a placeholder on their wall while um, the original is on display in the exhibit. So um, we kind of navigate those waters as they come. And really, it's just a case by case basis. But as a whole, many of them want to share. Um, their work with the community, so. Great. Um, Janet asked, do you know who the model is in the Curtis painting, Drifting on the Lagoon? I do not. Um, I, you know, I, I did have that thought though, as I was saying, when um, you think that with those pieces uh, where there's somebody right there, that especially someplace so intimate as that small boat, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't truly small, but small enough that it'd be weird to have a stranger there possibly. Um, you'd have to think that there was some kind of connection. Either they commissioned Ralph Wormley Curtis or they knew him. Maybe it was a family member or a friend, um, but no, I don't know definitively who the model was. Okay. Um, Robert says, my favorite artist of the Impressionist period has been Singer. Sergeant, how much of his work is available in collections for virtual view? So in the um, virtual exhibit of this exhibit, we have four of his pieces that are part of this exhibit. And actually you can see in my virtual background, um, <laughs> my finger points, that um, portrait is a John Singer Sergeant piece from the Columbus Museum. Um, that's in the exhibit and you can see that in the virtual tour as well as um, the other two, am I counting right? Yeah, the other two landscapes um, that are part of the exhibit as well. Okay. Um, Gail said she saw the exhibit in early December and it was so uplifting. We had another patron said, okay. um, thank you for adding some interest and beauty to a trying time. <laughs> It's helped us too, honestly, to be able to see that like bright, vibrant color. So. Yes. Um, Laura says you touched a little bit on how the artists, particularly women impressionists, supported themselves throughout their lives. Did most of them struggle financially? By what means did they live for the most part? Um, well, a lot of them, like um, Ralph Wormley Curtis and John Singer Sargent, came from affluent families. So travel and um, finances weren't really a roadblock for them in their journey, um, which is why when I was talking about Jane Peterson, why that was so remarkable that she was able to um, accomplish all that she did coming from those modest um, roots. Most of them had some form of um, 
family money via old money, new money, given the industrial times. Um, and others were art instructors. They lived off their art and um, teaching. So um, yeah, I don't know that any of the other artists truly really struggled, um, at least during the peaks of their career. As you go forward, you know, everybody, artists have an artist mind. And I say that being one <laughs> myself, but um, there's a struggle of one sort or another. And um, some of them, that I didn't touch upon in this presentation, lived, um, had a rougher time um, towards the ends of their lives. Okay. Um, Joan asked, did the French Impressionists respect the work of the American Impressionists? You know, I think that the Impressionists, because they weren't warmly received when they first came out, um, everyone was used to that traditional clean, crisp, um, traditional painting and painterly style. So I think the Impressionists really bonded and banded together as a unit um, to kind of stick up for what they were trying to do and what their movement was supposed to um, really appear like. So um, yeah, I think that there was definitely a camaraderie. Um, if there wasn't, I'd be hard pressed to believe that American artists would still flock and be welcomed at Giverny um, <laughs> because they'd kind of be like, no, no, you guys aren't good enough. Stay out of here. So yeah, I think that they were warmly regarded and um, worked well with each other. Okay. Um, Karen asks, when and who first named the style of painting Impressionism? And I feel like I should know this because I've listened to so many art talks at the library. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm testing your knowledge. Yeah, too. I'm kind of I'm drawing a blank as well. I feel like it's more. Um, uh, I I can't. I'm drawing a blank as to who would have penned that phrase, but it definitely is reflective of what the style is. It's not, again, like that photorealist, crisp, clean look. It you have an impression of what is there. It's not necessarily completely outlined for you. Um, you kind of have to piece some of the parts together and you think that it's there, you get the impression that um, you're seeing something, but then when you look closer, it might just be a dot here and a dot there. But to you looking at it um, from your perspective, it looks like um, flowers. So as to who said it, I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, Jan uh, Janet asks. At first glance, at first glance, glance, the model in drifting on the lagoon in her dress reminds me of the impressionist portrait that is at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I wondered if they were connected. Um, it's possible. I don't know um, offhand, but you know, if that piece that you're thinking of at the Cleveland Museum of Art was done by Ralph warmly Curtis, it's very possible because a lot of times artists would do their sketch, go back to their studio and um, create the actual painting. And they may create multiple variations of that same subject, maybe framed a little differently, um, not by an actual frame, but how like the view is depicted. Um, I know we have a um, Van Gorder in this exhibit that is very large um, from the Dayton Institute of Art. And I actually had a private collector reach out to me when he caught wind that we were doing this exhibit and he offered his piece to be part of the exhibit. Um, however, we declined. Um, so I guess that goes back to that previous question. We declined only for the reason that it was a smaller version of the piece that we were already getting. So to put that next to the larger one really wasn't going to fit in the gallery space. So um, but they would create different variations. So it's very possible if it's the same artist. Okay. Um, Mindy said, wonderful presentation, thank you. Um, the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut was a summer home for many of these artists. Something to investigate further for those who love the paintings. Some, of, some rooms the artists painted directly on the walls. Not a question, just a comment. That sounds like a conservation nightmare. <laughs> that sounds like it'd be a very difficult task to keep that um, <laughs> intact. 
Um, Bruce asks, would Mary Cassatt, awesome. would Mary Cassatt be considered an American Impressionist or are there any of her works in the exhibit? There are not any of her works in the exhibit. Um, I think we had considered it and we just weren't able to, um, there weren't any available. What happens um, sometimes these exhibits are planned three to five years in advance. So three years ago, the call to museums and these private lenders went out saying, hey, we looked at your collection. Um, would you be willing to loan us these pieces? And in some cases, they're like, absolutely, we'll let you do that. Um, they send us the agreement, we work that out, and then three years later, we get the piece. Other times, they already have exhibits that are pre-planned. So there's that conflict of time because you want to let paintings rest between when they're exhibited just for preservation purposes. So um, I, I wasn't involved in that process. I wasn't at the museum yet. But I would imagine that with the pieces that we had hoped to procure of Mary Cassatt, that may have been what happened. Um, because I know that it did, there were a few American Impressionism shows that kind of coincided or overlapped by um, a short frame of time with ours. So it kind of eliminated those as options. Well, we have one question left and it's a good one to end on. I think this is something we always like wonder when we're at these museums. How do you know that the paintings are authentic? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, actually, before I came to the Camp Museum of Art, they actually had an exhibit on um, art forgeries that was really cool. Um, but you you do the best you can. Um, some art forgers are really incredible and very gifted, and it's a shame that they use their talent um, <laughs> to forge another artist's work rather than making their originals. Um, but it goes through so many um, appraisals and assessments by so many um, different hands throughout the process of collections. And um, there's some things that are just hard to forge. Um, for example, in the sense of some of these private collections, like um, actually Lemaire, I wish I would have captured this before we hung it on the wall because I'm not even going to look at it again until we take it back down. Um, but it actually has the stickers. Um, when museums host exhibits and borrow pieces, often there's an exhibit sticker that gets put on the back of the canvas, kind of like, uh, or not on the back of the canvas, but the back of the framing, similar to like when you travel and um, your suitcase gets a luggage tag that kind of says where you've traveled to. Um, or your passport. Uh, so you can kind of track where pieces have been based off those stickers. And since art is so well documented, especially ones by artists of this caliber, it's really hard to um, copy that and then get that part of it correct as well. So um, we do our due diligence, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one to answer. Um, yeah. I mean, as far as I know, these are all authentic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Christy, for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time. And I'm sure many of us are excited to come and visit the Canton Museum of Art to see this um, exhibit. Again, it runs through March 7th. And you can uh, yes. visit their website. I'm sorry, is it cantonart.org? Cantonart.org, yes. OK cantonart.org and you can get your um, reserved tickets to, to go ahead and to see all the art that uh, Christy was so gracious to talk about tonight. Thank you all for joining us. And again, thank you, Christy, for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.